A lot of buttons up here. There we go. As soon as we figure out the podium, we're gonna be we're gonna be clicking here. Listen, thank you all for being here. I'm sorry for the late start. We were, just came off the house floor. We appreciate that um, uh, the vice commandant is here. We had an opportunity to spend some time together in Southern Florida recently. Got to participate in a um, in a an event where the USS Bear, excuse me, the U.S. Coast Guard vessel Bear was was uh, was able to bring back about 70 million dollars in. Um, confiscated cocaine and marijuana, so I want to, uh, before we even begin, uh, thank Admiral Ray for, uh, for all the help um, he provided when I was in Florida and, and all, the, all the great men and women who uh, I was able to learn from. Well, good afternoon. We'll come to order. Um, this afternoon's hearings on Arctic maritime infrastructure, both what is needed now and what is needed in the near future. Uh, the simple truth is the Arctic is warming. Uh, statement's not conjecture, but measurable and observable fact. Melting sea ice and the opening of navigable waters make shorter voyages and substantial cost savings possible for ocean carriers sailing between major trading blocks. So today we'll explore what infrastructure is necessary to safely and reliably sustain increased levels of commercial and governmental activity in this remote and inhospitable region. Similarly, increased oil and gas exploration, commercial shipping, and adventure tourism in the Arctic are likely to increase the risk of maritime accidents and create new sources of pollution in what still remains a mostly unspoiled domain. Yet at present, uh, harbors of refuge are few and far between. Despite several surveys, no deep water port facility has been built to support high latitude maritime operations. The US Coast Guard is tasked with maintaining maritime safety, search and rescue, emergency response, and law enforcement across this vast area but is asked to undertake these missions with limited resources or in the worst of circumstances like the government shutdown without being paid. Certainly, it was great news two weeks ago when the Coast Guard announced the award of a contract to finalize, design, and begin construction of the first new heavy icebreaker in over 45 years. But the reality remains the Coast Guard District 17, the district responsible for Alaska and the U.S. Arctic, has pressing air support deficiencies and substantial unmet shoreside infrastructure needs that pose considerable challenges to the Coast Guard capabilities uh, and mission readiness. As much of the Arctic is uniquely, uh, a uniquely challenging environment, it is also uniquely vulnerable. We currently rely on international cooperative efforts for coordinated search and rescue, navigational safety, and environmental safety for oversight and response in the high north. Strong U.S. involvement in the Arctic Council and International Maritime Organization can help mitigate risks and ensure the safety of maritime operations. But at what point do we become too reliant on the shared infrastructure and capabilities offered by our Arctic neighbors. For several years now, this subcommittee has examined the rapid emergence of the U.S. Arctic as a genuine new frontier, a frontier filled with grand promise, but great peril too. I look forward to hearing from our expert witnesses this afternoon to gather their recommendations on how best to secure our sovereign presence in the Arctic by making a strategic and sustained commitment to address our present and future maritime infrastructure needs. I uh, now call on the ranking member uh, for any opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Maloney. The United States defines the Arctic as the area north of the Aleutian Islands. That area includes 568,000 square nautical miles of the United States' exclusive economic zone, but very little maritime transportation infrastructure, infrastructure exists there. Extreme weather and sparse populations have kept maritime transportation in the area to a minimum. Fisheries and limited coastal transport occur there and large commercial vessels skirt the southern part of the area following the Great Circle Route. The Arctic ha has new and promising prospects for routine commercial vessel operations, resource extraction, and fisheries further to the north. In the last several years, a small number of recreational and passenger vessels have begun to venture into the far north. The Coast Guard has no year-round presence north of the Aleutian Islands since abandoning its three Lorne station in 2008. Cutters and air assets do venture into the area during the summer, and the Healy conducts research north of the Bering Strait. Unfortunately, as the GAO pointed out in 2016, the Coast Guard has no plan for or assets to address increased vessel traffic and other maritime uses of the Arctic. This is troubling <clears throat> since the vessel traffic and others' uses seem certain and increase significantly over the next two decades, and even more troubling given the interests of Russia and China in the Arctic. The United States needs to be, f 
to be able to fully assert its sovereignty in the Arctic, as well as carry out its search and rescue maritime safety, living marine resources, and environmental protection responsibilities. Of course, this nearly blank slate gives us the opportunity to carry out these missions in new and innovative ways. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today and what they believe we need to do to, to assert our sovereignty in the North to assure a safe and efficient maritime transportation system there. Thank you. Chairman, you back. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, I'd now like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Oregon's 4th District, chairman of our committee, uh, my friend Peter Fazio, for any opening remarks you'd like to make. Uh, thank you, and thanks for, uh, for holding uh, this incredibly important hearing. Uh, this, this has been a topic that has uh, kind of escaped uh, the notice of uh, uh, past uh, administrations and, uh, and the Congress itself, and uh, we really need to uh, begin to plan more quickly than any of us ever thought uh, for the opening of the Northwest Passage. In fact, I, I don't know where I was because I've been doing a lot of travel and talking to a lot of people over the weekend, but I talked to someone who was going on a uh, a cruise and they expect to try and get across and I said well I hope you're in touch with the Canadians and our Coast Guard because you know we don't have a lot of capability up there uh, but it's a, a sailing ship out of uh, I think Denmark or something it's a known cruise company in any case uh, so the future is here uh, potentially and uh, you know we, we've got to begin to deal with it much more pragmatically and strategically uh, that's why we have the uh, the Coast Guard here today uh, I'm I'm Thrilled we're finally uh, on track for uh, a, an icebreaker, hopefully to be followed by five more, and uh, you know begin to uh, uh, be able to deal with the, both the challenges of our duties uh, in, at the South Pole and uh, and in the Arctic. Uh, and the Great Lakes need a little help too with ice breaking, so I don't want to neglect the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, I, I applaud you for uh, releasing the 2019 Arctic Strategy. I, I think. Uh, that that is a great step forward. And, uh, you know, we look forward to your testimony today and whatever other recommendations uh, you might provide to the committee. And also, I know the we have a number of other witnesses on the second panel, and I, I think the chairman has done a great job of assembling a, uh, a group of folks who will help instruct us and in whatever we might need to do in a Coast Guard reauthorization or other bills to move forward uh, productively in the Arctic. So with that, I yield back to balance my time. I uh, thank the gentleman. And, um uh, seeing the ranking uh, member proceed to our first witness, uh, we're very fortunate to be joined by Admiral Charles W. Ray, Vice Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. Thank you, sir, for being here today. We look forward to your testimony. I did mention uh, the bear. I should probably mention that we are also on the Isaac Mayo before I get myself in trouble. Uh, I want to thank those, um, those remarkable uh, men and women as well and for all the work you do. And, um, and we're, we're, uh, we're in possession of your written uh, statement. So if we could ask you to keep your opening remarks to five minutes, uh, it would help the members uh, proceed to their questions. Um, go ahead, sir. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, Chairman DeFazio, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate this opportunity to address you as the 31st uh, Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, and thank you for uh, entering my written comments into the record. Before I move on to the Arctic, sir, I wanted to just thank this committee for your support for the Pay Our Coast Guard legislation and thank Chairman DeFazio for, for the same support. As I travel around, as I have with you down in Miami, out to the West Coast to LA, up to Kodiak, and down to Puerto Rico, this is one of the most frequent subjects that comes up with our folks that are out doing the work of the nation in the Coast Guard. And so I thank you for your support moving forward, and uh, we really need to get this across the goal line. Thank you. Moving on the Arctic, Admiral Schultz and I look forward to continuing to work with this committee to advance our nation's security, sovereignty, and economic interest in the Arctic. As you all know, the, Arctic, the, coast, the uh, United States is an Arctic nation, and the Coast Guard has been the lead federal agency up there for over 150 years. As the nation's only surface presence in the region, the Coast Guard advances our national interests the unique blend of polar operational capability, regulatory authorities, and international relationships. Over the past decade, as the chairman stated, as accessibility has improved, global competition has increased, the Arctic is involved in an increasingly important geostrategic region that requires a whole of government work. Today, nations seek to shape the security environment to their own advantage. Our two near-peer competitors, Russia and China, have declared the Arctic a strategic priority, 
and to continue to aggressively develop the capability and infrastructure to expand their influence. Even in the face of this increased competition, U.S. interests are well served by working with the eight Arctic nations. The Coast Guard continues to build trust and diplomacy with allies, partners, native residents, and international bodies like the International Maritime Organization and the Arctic Coast Guard Forum to promote our nation's influence in this critical region. Our recently published Arctic Strategic Outlook reaffirms our commitment to American leadership. It establishes three lines of effort to achieve long-term success. First will be our, we will enhance our capability to operate effectively in the dynamic Arctic domain. We will strengthen rules-based order and, and adherence to the rule of law. Thirdly, we'll innovate and adapt to promote resiliency and prosperity. For the United States to lead in the Arctic, we must maintain a physical presence. The foundation of this presence is the Coast Guard's icebreaking fleet, and I want to thank this committee. I can't thank you enough. It's 43 years in the making for us to get where we are today. Uh, for your support to begin long overdue recapitalization of our only heavy icebreaker. And as you all know, we awarded that contract on the 23rd, and we hope it's the first of several that we need to do the nation's business in the polar regions. Um, our presence also includes operation in communities in the polar regions, in the Arctic, and waters across the region. Most notably, every uh, year we have a year-long operation called Operation Arctic Shield that includes deploying ships, aviation assets, and Coast Guard crews of the Arctic to conduct research and operations, law enforcement, marine safety, and engage with the communities. Part of this is facility and vessel inspections, part of its contingency re response exercises, we are focused on the marine transportation system. For over 150 years, your Coast Guard has operated in the Arctic and served Alaska communities. We are committed to this vital region and we currently maintain shore infrastructure in Alaska, all across Alaska, and that is the stepping off point Kodiak is for most of our work in the actual Arctic. And so we appreciate your support for infrastructure, where we will soon, in the next few years, home port six fast response cutters and two offshore patrol cutters. As you know, the Coast Guard faces an extensive uh, shore infrastructure backlog that we last tracked at about $1.7 billion. A big part of that's across Alaska where we need to work on piers and wharves and houses and uh, community centers for our people. In closing, a strong presence in Alaska enables the Coast Guard to safeguard our national interest in the Arctic. I thank this committee for your unwavering support as your Coast Guard invests in our Alaska fleet and infrastructure. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Admiral Ray. Um, now proceed to members' questions, uh, which will be limited to five minutes, begin by recognizing uh, myself. Um, Admiral, first let me start by saying, um, because the focus of today's hearing is on uh, the Arctic and, and Alaska in many ways, you know, I should mention that, that we lost a member of the Coast Guard community in Alaska, a young man named Michael Kozlowski, uh, who's actually a resident of my district, who, whose family lives about eight miles from my house. His wife, Bree, and their kids at least grew up there, I should say. And, um, and that's a loss we felt very acutely in the Hudson Valley. I want to thank the Commandant for coming up for the funeral and, and for the extraordinary support that the Coast Guard has shown uh, to Mr. Kozlowski's family. Uh, we hate to see these things happen, but it is a reminder of the sacrifices uh, uh, members of the Coast Guard make every day. So we thank the Coasties for that. Uh, let me ask you about the, um, I'm interested in the Polish security cutter. Um, you talk about, um, about how many, could you describe for us the, the capabilities that that vessel's going to provide, how many ships we need, how that compares to uh, the fleets that, that we see from the Russians and, and from others? Yes, sir, thank you for your question. Thank you for attending Bozen Kozlowski's funeral. It's uh, the point of the inherently nature, dangerous nature of our business, well, we thank you for your support. It meant a lot. Uh, with regards to Polish security cutter, the Commandant's been saying, and, and we've all been saying this, we, we did a study a few years ago called the High Latitude Study, which did analysis of the Coast Guard's 11 mission areas, which ones apply to the Arctic, the Antarctic, and it kind of arrayed what, where we need to be and when. And a long story short, we need the ability to project year-round presence in the Arctic, and that's possible with the right kind of icebreakers. It's possible to be up there summertime and wintertime. And so when we do the math, and it's fairly straightforward, and you do what it takes to 
to do that when you consider shipyard availabilities. We need six overall icebreakers. Uh, three of those need to be heavy icebreakers to be able to project our presence in the Arctic and do our yearly duty to break out the National Science Foundation station in McMurdo, which is also vital to the nation's interest down in Antarctica. And then we need three medium icebreakers that do any number of things, uh, from, from scientific research to doing uh, projecting sovereignty in places where there's boundary areas. Uh, they, they will be national or polar security cutters as well. And it's important that we talk about them as security cutters as opposed to just icebreakers because all Coast Guard ships are multi-mission and they can be doing one mission one day and the next day they can be doing search and rescue, law enforcement, or any of the others. So six and three is, is how we've been shaping this up, but we're really excited about the first one now that we've got that off the ways and going. And uh, we expect to uh, uh, great things from the halter down in Pascagoula. They've got a great record. And uh, if that answers your question, sir. Yeah, I'm also interested in, in how our capabilities compare to those of, of, of other great powers who may be uh, thinking strategically about the Arctic, particularly Russia, China. Uh, can you say a word about that and what kind, of, what, what kind of comparison would you make between our capabilities right now and those of, uh, of those two countries? As we say in the maritime services, we are in a big stern chase with the Russians, sir. I mean, they've got 50 icebreakers of various classes, four of them are nuclear-powered, uh, heavy icebreakers. Um, they've been committed to a rebuilding program for their icebreaker fleet for many years without fail. The Chinese just this year launched their second icebreaker, which is uh, approaching a heavy icebreaker. It's a Shui Long 2. And they are extremely aggressive with how they sail these. The Shui Long 1, which was their first icebreaker, has been to the Arctic every year for the past five or six, our Arctic, uh, off of our, and they're, a, they're not an Arctic nation. And so, the Shui Long 2, the expectation is they will be similarly in their way that they sail and engage around the planet. Uh, of course, in the Baltic states, I, I'm sorry, in the uh, Scandinavian states, there are uh, multiple icebreakers, but they are mainly littoral, close in. They're not uh, projecting over the horizon. So when we think of other nations' icebreakers, we primarily think of the Russians and the Chinese. The Swedes have some uh, long-distance icebreakers, but other than that, that's kind of the, that's the ones that we talk about. And if I could get you to say a word about the, uh, the shoreside infrastructure that we're also going to need. Yes, sir. Um, with regards to Coast Guard uh, shoreside infrastructure, our current focus is where all of our people depart from to go to the Ark. That's the Kodiak. That's our northernmost place. And so that's where we have the most plans and the most specifics about investment. Our approach, as you know, um, to operating in the Arctic, given the dynamic nature of it, is we'll take these icebergs, when we get sufficiently built out, we can move them wherever the, wherever the fight is, and fight is just a term of art, wherever the action is, we will move those icebergs. So it could be as far south as, you know, approaching the Bering Sea, or as far east as our border with Canada. And, uh, and so that's our approach, this mobile, uh, uh, infrastructure that will deploy. And that's why icebreakers or polar security cutters are so important. That region is not ice free. It is it's just less multi-year ice than there has been in the history of the world. Uh, but so the ability to move and operate in ice covered waters, whether it's just a year's worth of ice or a couple of years, that's our approach operationally. The preponderance of our infrastructure requests for the U.S. Coast Guard are in Kodiak and other parts of Alaska where we support that region. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Gibbs. Thank you. First of all, Admiral and, and all the men and women that serve under you, I want to thank you for uh, gratitude to the country because the Coast Guard's doing great work in drug interdiction and everything else you do in security. So I want to make sure you, you, you appreciate what you all do. Um, my first question, when we're talking about the polar security card of the PSC, um, and we got that going. Now, I guess one of my first questions, you're talking uh, down the road, we get the first one, it's been 40 years, I guess, whatever it was you said, um, getting a, a, you know, a second or third one. And would it, would it be more economical to maybe work on, have to get the production line set up to uh, just do like five heavies instead of do any medium icebreakers and just, uh, you know, could we save dollars by uh, making a long-term commitment to, to make all heavies and not, not change the production cycle, the production assembly line? and all the, all the work that goes into developing a whole new, you know, different size ship, but go ahead. 
It could be, sir. I mean, there are no doubt that there are economies of scale when it comes to and to producing the same class of ship from the same yard over. Uh, I think every all the bodies that are have studied this agree that we need at least three of these heavies. Yeah. So, and the 43 years I referred to earlier, that's the last time we built a heavy icebreaker. Look at forward. We can't wait 43 years. Yeah. We're looking to having her in the water uh, in 24 at the latest with incentives on the contract to do it sooner than that, 23, which is fairly rapid for this class of ship. So, uh, and we, we intend to... Uh, um, continue to seek uh, uh, Polar Security Cutter 2 and 3 moving forward, and then we'll be in a position to decide how, how things are shaping up. I'm, yeah, I just want to just raise the question, you know, you have to get that production set up, maybe the transition to a, a different class, maybe that doesn't make sense, and the heavies can do more anyways. I, um, on this first one, um, when it gets operational, of course, a lot of the time it's going to be spent down in the, uh, for the National Science Foundation at the Mark Mudo Station in Antarctica. What uh, do you look, uh, what, anticipate how many days it'd be up in the Arctic? Sir, when I first came in the service in 1981, we had, uh, I want to say, uh, five icebreakers. And we did Arctic East, Arctic West. We did uh, Antarctic Patrol. So when we have the capacity that we need, we will send these ships north and south. And they will be, uh, we'll be operating in places that we traditionally operated, but we haven't had the capacity to do lately. So... Um, with regards to when we would send in the Arctic, we'll need to get, uh, we are doing work to extend the service life of Polar Star. Uh, we're starting that next year because we need to extend her out until we get a second heavy icebreaker. When we have two heavy icebreakers, then we can talk about, in operation, okay. we could talk about sending one north. Uh, and that will, could be, that will not be before 23. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about uh, gaps. I, I know in panel three, they talk about uh, some of the, um, uh, gaps, I guess, uh, shortfalls, and, and they said navigable waters, physical infrastructure, information infrastructure, responsibilities, vessel operations, and also the GAO reported the Coast Guard uh, studies uh, gaps would be communications, Arctic maritime domain awareness, infrastructure, and training and exercise opportunities, and ice breaking. Can you um, kind of relate to us on how you try to fill these gaps and, and what our, what our uh, operational status is, I guess, from Talk about these challenges you have in the gaps. Yes, sir. We have, uh, with regards to the waterways, uh, kind of just going down top to bottom, if, if you don't mind, we have uh, worked with the Waterways Safety Committee to, to study the waterways, starting from the Unimac Pass, which is down in the Aleutians, all the way up to the Bering Straits. And, and so uh, understanding we developed, uh, working with the Russians, a port access a route study, which is in essence the prequel for a traffic separation scheme that has been both coordinated with the native community with regards to the migratory patterns of their subsistence uh, lifestyle and then with the draft and worked with NOAA and others. So I guess on the front end, the prevention work on the waterways, I think we've moved down the road with that. With regard to physical infrastructure, as I said, thanks to this committee, uh, we have got a good start on infrastructure that we need to be able to sail and operate from Kodiak. That's our center of gravity in Alaska. Just about everyone that goes to the Arctic, their last stop is in Kodiak before they go there. So we are making progress to do that. And that's where their families live. That's where their kids go to school. That's where that's our center of gravity. So that's our part with regards to physical infrastructure. With regards to the information infrastructure, there's several things going on. Uh, we are working with the Department of Defense to get access to MUOS, which is an updated uh, Department of Defense satellite communication, and we're making progress to where we can communicate reliably with satellite communications up to the 85th latitude, which is further than we've ever been able to do before. We've been somewhat constrained to either line of sight communications and or um, HF communications, which is a little bit intermittent up there. Uh, and then we launched this year two CubeSats that we, uh, in cooperation with, with other government agencies, to do a polar orbit to receive emergency signals. And so um, when you put those together, we're working on the communications part. And then lastly, with regards to our vessel operations, we've talked about the icebreaker, the national security cutter, and to us, that is the most fundamental leap forward. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Admiral Ray, uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you very much for your service and your leadership of the fine men and women that serve in the Coast Guard. I have an opportunity, the privilege to serve on the House Armed Services Committee, where we have oversight of the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines. So this term, being appointed to the Transportation Infrastructure, it's a real honor to kind of round out uh, all the components uh, that uh, work together uh, in defense of our, our nation and our nation's interests, both home and abroad. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned Operation Arctic Shield uh, as the Coast Guard's year-round planning and operational endeavor, which provides mobile and scalable presence in the Arctic domain. Uh, you also mentioned the Coast Guard's goal is to further develop a comprehensive understanding of the capabilities required to operate in the Arctic, as well as to broaden partnerships in support of Arctic operations. My question, uh, there, um, there are two, they're related. Uh, can you talk about what those partnerships are uh, and, and explain their value. How do we better leverage them to, to ensure we are meeting our operational needs? And related to that, how can we upscale or strengthen or improve your relationship with the Navy to fill existing gaps in our capabilities? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your service across the armed services. You've covered the whole gamut now. Thank you. Uh, well, our partnerships, it's, it's really this Arctic Shield. I'm really proud of this. We've been doing it for several years now. It starts literally at the village level. We engage with village elders and across multiple villages across the North Slope. And uh, we, our people go up there uh, all year round, but we particularly surge in the summer when it's ice out. And, uh, and we engage at the, you know, at the school kid level. We, engage, we educated over 400 kids from the North Slope, and that's a lot of kids on the North Slope. Uh, we educated 400 of them in you know, kind of water safety and things like that. And then you work your way up to the, the native corporation level, which are really significant elements of governance there in Alaska and in the Arctic, all the way up to the state and then, of course, the federal level. We work across all partners. Our specific partners for Arctic Shield are the Department of Defense. We work with the Northern Command. They do, uh, uh, and the Alaska folks in Alaska down in Elmendorf, they do a lot of our transport of our equipment up there. And so we interact. Our helicopters are housed in a... Alaska Air National Guard hangar in Kotzebue, uh, which I think we rent for about a dollar a year, which is a pretty good deal in Alaska. And uh, we, so great cooperation across the way. With regards to the Navy, we are consistently uh, at the table planning with the U.S. Navy. We would not be where we are today with our Polar Security Cutter program were it not for our integrated program office with the U.S. Navy. I meet with Assistant Secretary Gertz who is just an incredible uh, uh, servant of the nation with regards to acquisition. He's one of the best we got. And, and if it were not for him and his crew, we wouldn't be where we are with the Polar Security Cutter. Uh, of course, with your support as well, but the ability to execute that. Uh, our Commandant and CNO are engaged with regards to the requirements for uh, strategic planning. We have provided input to the Navy and they've accepted that. They're leaning forward to meet their requirements with regards to the NDAA. Thank you. Let me uh, ask this question. In your testimony, you also talk about the need for the Coast Guard to maintain a robust uh, infrastructure in Alaska to support operations and uh, capacity needs. You also state that approximately 10% uh, of the Coast Guard's real property inventory is located in Alaska. Uh, the questions, uh, with the reduced ice conditions or certainly the changing ice conditions in the Arctic and free-flowing seas that create erosion, are there any Coast Guard installations that are currently at risk as a result of the changing landscape, and is the Coast Guard tracking which installations may be at risk in the future? And if you need to take that for the record, that's fine as well. Sir, I think I can answer that. Um, the um, weather in the Kodiak region, which is about our furthest north and west place, has been pretty consistent over the past few years. I mean, it's, there's bad weather there, and big tidal range and you're just one storm away from having a problem. But with regards to the durability and resiliency, we are in there. That's why this recapitalization of our shore infrastructure is so important. It's a consistent drumbeat. We're literally updating World War II era buildings to modern resiliency standards. And when we do that, they, they'll last for 50 or 70 years. But north of that, we generally operating out of temporary facilities. We're doing it season, we're moving. Uh, on our ships and in our aircraft to different places. So I will do a review and get back to you if there's any other ones that we need to track, but I'm not aware of any right now. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. 
Thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, we appreciate you being here. Um, and in full disclosure, my uncle, the last of five surviving boys, um, was a Coastie. And uh, so we, we sure appreciate what y'all do. Um, the Bering Strait uh, width offhand, do you know how wide that is across there? The closest point is, I'll have to, I've looked at this several times and you hear between 50 and 75 nautical miles, but it's not any more than 75. So safe to say you don't go summer camping up there. No, sir. But I mean, I've been through it several times, but I've read it. This comes up pretty regularly. And in fact, I made a note to myself last night to recheck what the latest estimate. Uh, you, the last estimate I saw was about 70 nautical miles. Did you put that note in your, in your iPhone? <laughs> yeah, no, what, sir. I wrote it in a little green book. Well, that's the way we normally do it, you know, at our age. Uh, do you expect, how many days away, uh, when you get the first PSC, do you expect them to be at sea on, on task, so to speak, on the mission? Our general planning factor for our cutters, major cutters, is 185 days away from a home port. That's general planning. We exceed that with some degree of regularity. Rarely do we not meet that, uh, unless there's a maintenance issue. And with some of our older cutters now, that is a little bit of a problem. So. 185 days away from home port is, for instance, when, when the Polar Star goes south to Antarctica, it's about a 100-day mission, more or less, uh, uh, maybe approaching 120. Uh, and then when Healy goes north, it's at least a three or four-month patrol up north in the Arctic. So that's kind of the standard planning factor. Would those numbers be the same for the second PSC? Yes, sir. Third? Yes, sir. I mean, that's general. We, we'll look at it. We look at it quite frequently. In fact, with the national security cutters, uh, we just went through a pretty extensive review a couple of years ago about how many days away from home port was recommended. Because the flip side to that is you got to do maintenance on them when they're back in. And, and we need people to continue to want to go to sea, so they got to have a little bit of time to uh -huh. see their family. So it's a flip side. Uh, but um, generally speaking, 185 days is our planning factor, and we revisit it every few years. Absolutely. Do you see a, a Chinese and a Russian presence up there around the Bering Strait? Have you been able to determine who's there the most? Yes, sir. Uh, they're, they are there. The Russians, I mean, the transits through the Bering Strait have been, a lot of it's been um, as a result of the Russian kind of growth in their petroleum uh, uh, exploration right. on the north slope of Russia. And, and so there's a more transit, and more transit is expected. That growth is going to continue as they go down to Asia. With regards to the Chinese thus far, other than their commercial enterprises where they are engaged with the Russians, and they are to a degree, um, their, their independent icebreaker operations are primarily, they'll call it research. We call it other things when they go up north Recon of our country. Reconnaissance. Yes, sir. And so uh, that's, that's generally, and they are there. Um, they're there from the shoulder seasons, we'll call it, early summer to late fall, all the way through the summer, depending on what their operational plan is. Did I understand you to say the Russians have 50 icebreakers, four of which are nuclear? Yes, sir. Are you able to identify those going through? What, uh, what percentage? Uh, they are generally working, staying up on the North Slope, those, their northern sea route. They, ju they do not venture south. Most of the time, their operations are from the northern part of the, just north of the Bering Strait, over west, all the way to, to Europe. So those nuclear vessels could stay out a lo lot longer than the traditional vessels? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and then you said something that caught my attention. You said you have generally a line of sight communications? Well, there are multiple frequencies uh, that we use for operational communications. We do sat phones, everybody's in, informed of that. Uh, the, a lot of the smaller vessels, that, and there are small vessels that you wouldn't think would be up in the Arctic, that they're up there now. So you try to hail them, hail them by radio? Yes, sir. FM radio is what, that's line of sight radio. Oh, that's line of sight. Okay, I got yes, you. Okay, I, I misunderstood that. So depending on how high your antenna is, is how far your line of sight is. I got you. Uh, okay, well, I appreciate that, Admiral, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to start, I'd like uh, to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, testimony of Willie Goodwin, the chairman of the Arctic Waterway Safety Committee. That objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. And related to that, my first question is about indigenous uh, peoples. Um, uh, 
I wanted to highlight a little bit more about their indigenous needs amidst the traffic, increased traffic of uh, larger ships. You mentioned North Slope uh, cooperation, but obviously transit uh, is um, going north and then going presumably east or west. So how is the Coast Guard fully collaborating with indigenous groups in the, in the U.S. Arctic to balance their sovereignty and subsistence hunting needs uh, with the growing presence of larger vessels? We, in fact, I know Mr. Goodwin, uh, and thank you for, you know, for your entering his statements. Uh, we pride ourselves on taking into account the perspective of the natives when it comes to the use of the oceans adjacent to the lands that they've occupied for centuries. And, uh, and we go about it in multiple ways, uh, but primarily with regards to the Bering Straits Port Access Route Study was a good example. That was specifically designed with the migration routes of the whales that they hunt, of the walruses, and other animals that they use uh, for their uh, lifestyle. Um, and so we will do the same thing we've started. We have started the initial phases of an Arctic Coast Port Access Route Study, which will take the same things into, um, you know, into account. Uh, we also uh, engage with the elders with regards to just how to operate in the Arctic. And, you know, it, it's, it's really an interesting situation to go up there as a person from the lower 48 and try to, uh, you know, provide value. It's, it's, it's an important thing to go up and respect them. And uh, we preach this. We, we have uh, kind of uh, instructional for our people that have never been to the Arctic. And, uh, and we talk to them about the value of doing that and respect about the others. It sounds, maybe it doesn't sound exactly that high tech, but it's really important. And so we take their input into effect with regards to any scheme that we uh, uh, propose. And these are schemes that will go in all the way to the International Maritime Organization. They have factored in the native perspective. We take the same approach to Representative Young. <laughs> <laughs> um, how far along are you in putting together firmer operation plans um, in, the, in the Arctic? Uh, sounds like you're doing some experimenting, but how much of this CONOPS is actually getting written into the Coast Guard's um, longer term operation plans? Well, we're, you know, the Arctic is a place that you don't operate. When you need to operate there, it's too late. You need to be planning now to operate there. Everything's harder. When you go north, it is hard. It's harder to fuel airplanes. It's harder to get airplanes started. It's harder to moor ships. It's harder to... Everything we do is dangerous, as the chairman talked about. Uh, that was in Homer, Alaska. That's far south compared to where I'm talking about operating. And so it's... We send new coasties up there every year. We go up there in Arctic Shield, and they'll rotate. We have air crews. We have crews from multiple ships we send up there. We send people to Nome and other places to do commercial vessel inspections. And so... All these people are learning how to operate in the Arctic. And, and it's a yearly thing that we do, and we surge it during the summer months when more, there's more activity, so we're more ready. So it, you get there, this operation is, uh, it is ongoing. Last year alone, we had 20 search and rescue cases, and, I, and the number that sticks to my mind is I think we had 35 lives saved. Now, some of this varied from caribou hunters out east of the North Slope to actual people in distress at sea. We're not, if we get a call, we'll go wherever it needs to be to uh, look for them. So would, would we're you, doing actual operations. So, yeah, so would, you, would you assess that you're making now, you're a point where you're making marginal changes or you're still making larger changes to operation plans? Well, the, the biggest you can change- wrap, wrap up, I got another question, so just make it quick. Yes, sir. Uh, we are making uh, marginal changes that will go along in capability. All right. And finally, um, uh, how does not being part of the Law of the Sea Treaty help or hinder the Coast Guard op sovereignty operations in the Arctic? The Law of the Sea could help us moving forward. And, and, and multiple people believe it would be a significant help when it comes to rights over extended continental seabed and, and other issues. Um, the Coast Guard operates uh, as if we were a party to it, and thus far that has been effective for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lowenthal. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Admiral. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us about the urgent need to improve our Coast Guard's Arctic capabilities and to continue to protect our country's significant interests in this region. As the Coast Guard's Arctic strategic outlook notes, seawater temperature rise has already begun to affect the migration pattern of fish stocks in the Arctic, creating new risks of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing that can undermine our efforts to maintain healthy fish stocks. I'm proud that the U.S. brokered the Central Arctic Ocean Agreement to prevent overfishing in the Arctic with a joint effort for scientific monitoring of fish migration in this region. In addition to a moratorium on unregulated fishing, this effort will help to establish a scientific baseline measure for the Arctic Ocean ecosystem so we can measure the effects of climate change and fisheries activity. But Admiral, these are just good intentions without the resources we need to protect American interests in the Arctic, both to enforce fishery laws and to conduct this important, this important research. Admiral, can you tell us how the Coast Guard is working to support the scientific and fisheries enforcement missions now? And what capabilities the, surface, the service is investing in to ensure that we carry out these initiatives in the years going forward? Sir, we support the science efforts of NOAA and, and NIMFAS and, and others with regards to understanding the fish stocks in the Bering and North. And uh, we, um, and so, and we also work with the other Arctic nations to uh, understand their assessment of fisheries, you know, uh, progress and, and their perspective on the fisheries. Uh, I think the bottom line is the Coast Guard has maintained a presence in the Bering Sea uh, continuously in, in my lifetime. Uh, and focus on fisheries, focused on enforcing fisheries. There was a time a few years ago when we were nose to nose with the Russians over the fisheries in the Bering Sea. Those, we cooperate much better now than we did a few years ago. So we have a presence, we understand the fisheries, and we move our forces uh, to, to be in a position to surveil and to, in some cases, rescue the fishermen that are working in those regions. I was just wondering, following up on the last part, what are the capabilities that the service now is investing in uh, to ensure that we carry out these initiatives in the future? Could you kind of target, tell us a little bit about exactly what, what you're investing in, what are the capabilities to carry out this, this venture in the future? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, to, thanks to this committee, we are we talked about the Polar Security Cutter. That will provide a platform to do fisheries enforcement from anywhere in the Arctic. Uh, the second thing is National Security Cutters, which we've been building for several years and have had great effect on our enforcement missions. We will be home porting two offshore patrol cutters in Kodiak that will have the reach to go all the way up to the ice edge. And they're not ice uh, cutters, but they will have the ability to get to the ice edge. So, And then H-60 helicopters, we are... Uh, we are once again, thanks to this, we are actually growing the fleet of those H-60 helicopters to be able to reach out to get to the fishermen. And our H-65 helicopters, we're extending the service life of those. Those are the ones that embark on our ships in the Arctic and in the Bering Sea. Thank you, Admiral, and I yield back. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral. As you look at the Arctic as a zone of increasing competition, um, in the past year there's been a lot of reports that the Chinese Communist Party has attempted to secure a greater presence, um, not only in the Arctic in general, but in Greenland in particular. And we've had to work with our allies, um, in Denmark in particular, to deny them that access. Tell us a little bit about how you view the Chinese threat in that region in general, and then how we should be thinking about Greenland in particular. Yes, sir, I was just in Finland about a month ago with the uh, folks from Denmark and, uh, and Greenland, 
And so kind of have pretty fresh uh, perspective from them. Um, of course, we've got a strategic United States base, uh, Tool Air Force Base here in Northwest or North or Western, and that is critically important. And there's no doubt in my mind that part of the Chinese intent is to get close to that as they can. And so we need to be mindful of that, I believe, uh, because of uh, um, the, what our icebreaker fleet will allow us to do, speaking from a Coast Guard perspective, is will allow us to have the capacity to patrol around Greenland as we did, you know, uh, in years past. And so having that presence is important to our allies mm -hmm. to be able to work there to support them. Because when you get east of Nuke on the lower west side of Greenland, there's no humans mm -hmm. around that side on the east side and north. And, uh, and they need, you know, that's a, that's a partnership that we need to continue to develop, and that's our intent. Do you think there's room for a greater U.S. presence uh, in Greenland going forward. I know, I believe it's finalized that we've uh, opened up a consulate in, in Nuke, uh, which I view as a, a great step forward and, and, and long overdue. Do you think there's room to expand our presence? Well, I, I won't speak to the terrestrial part of it. That's not my, uh, <laughs> my purview, but I do believe having the ships that are capable of sailing those waters is important and there's room for advancement on that. And then we had, I believe, last week, the Pentagon delivered its uh, annual report on Chinese military capabilities, and there was a special section contained therein uh, solely devoted to Chinese activity in the Arctic. Um, I, perhaps you could give us the Coast Guard's perspective on that report or, or that section. I know it's related to my first question, but just wanted to give you a chance because I'm, I'm not sure that report's yet been widely read on the Hill, but I view it as particularly important. The, uh, my perspective on the Chinese activity in the Arctic is um, that it's not much different than Chinese activity in the rest of the world. It is, uh, they exert presence, they kind of uh, uh, sail where they can, and, uh, and by maintaining, establishing presence, they kind of, there almost becomes an acceptance of that. I mean, to talk about the Chinese in the Arctic when the closest point of China to the Arctic is you know, somewhere around 900 nautical miles, uh, that's, that's kind of a stretch. And so uh, you heard our Secretary of State in the last couple of days and his comments about that, and we, we certainly concur with that. I think in the Arctic what we see is they're doing uh, exploration, they're doing science, but they're also doing exploration for economic purposes, and they're doing exploration for other purposes as well. Uh, and finally, I just want to close by saying that you have some incredible young uh, men and women in Northeast Wisconsin that are representing the Coast Guard very well. We appreciate their presence and they're a great part of our community. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, sir. Great Lakes are an important part of the Coast Guard. Thank you. Would the gentleman like to yield uh, 30 seconds to the ranking member for a question? I, I'd be honored to yield. <laughs> thank, thank, you, thank you for yielding. Just a quick question, Admiral. Uh, the Coast Guard is finalizing its uh, Bering Sea Port Access Route Study and um, uh, the implementation of that, uh, shipping routes and safety in, in the Arctic region. Uh, and the concern I have, uh, there's a study done five years ago in the Atlantic Coast Port Access Route Study, and I believe nothing's really come about that or an implementation of that. Uh, will we get a commitment that the study will be, for the Bering um, Route Study will be, uh, you know, implemented? Yes, sir. In fact, we've made great progress on that. That was, uh, you know, ratified at the International Maritime Organization this past year. And it was kind of unprecedented cooperation between us and the Russians. It just shows there's things we could cooperate on we don't cooperate on other things. And the Coast Guard has kind of prided ourselves through the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum and now the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. We find areas that we think there is um, room for cooperation and we focus on those and not others. And that access route study was one of those. And, and we'll work for implementation when we get it. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Admiral. I want to, uh, without objection, uh, move on to the second panel, but I want to thank Admiral Ray for his time. I also want to associate myself with the questioning and the, the remarks of the gentleman from Wisconsin. A lot of us are very concerned about the strategic threat posed by the Chinese in the Arctic and everywhere else. And so um, I want you to understand that there is broad-based concern here uh, on, on their activities, and we'll be very interested in your ongoing perspective on that and what you're seeing, uh, something we're all very interested in. Sir, thank you very much for your time. I'd like to move to the second panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it.
I'd like to uh, now welcome our second panel of witnesses. Uh, we're joined by Rear Admiral Shepard Smith, Director of the Office of Coast uh, Survey of the National Oceana uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, NOAA, and Colonel Philip Borders, Commander of District Alaska of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you for being here. Gentlemen, we look forward to your testimony. Uh, without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Uh, as with the previous panel, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony uh, to five minutes, if possible. You may proceed. Uh, Admiral Smith. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Shepard Smith, and I'm the Director of the Office of Coast Survey at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration within the Department of Commerce. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on our work to support safe and efficient marine transportation in the Arctic. The U.S. is an Arctic nation by virtue of Alaska's geography. The remote and harsh environment there results in short operating seasons and other unique challenges requiring extensive collaboration with international and regional partners. To this end, NOAA cooperates with academic, regional, state, and indigenous stakeholders. We also rely on and support our federal partners in the Coast Guard, Navy, Army Corps of Engineers, and the Departments of Interior and Energy, all of whom, including NOAA, are part of the Interagency Committee on the Marine Transportation System. NOAA services and products related to navigation, weather, and emergency response science are featured heavily in parts of the CMTS 10-year prioritization of infrastructure needs in the U.S. Arctic. We have been working to increase NOAA's presence in the Arctic since 1870 when the Coast and Geodetic Survey schooner, Yukon, surveyed Alaskan waters and our Arctic work began. I will give a general overview of NOAA's services, but focus mostly on our navigation services that support maritime commerce emergency response and environmental stewardship in the Arctic. NOAA is committed to pr producing reliable marine transportation, weather and hazard assessment, and other services to safeguard life, property, infrastructure, and security in the Arctic. This work also allows stakeholders and constituents to make informed decisions that protect Arctic communities, economies, and ecosystems. NOAA's navigation services, notably our nautical charts, are essential to moving goods and services safely and efficiently in the Arctic. Nautical charts are built upon the core NOAA competencies and responsibilities, positioning, tides and water level data, shoreline mapping, and hydrographic surveying. NOAA supports accurate positioning through the National Spatial Reference System. This is the national coordinate system managed by our National Geodetic Survey that allows us to make precise uh, spatial measurements. To continue our efforts to make the system more accurate, NOAA completed the collection of airborne gravity data on mainland Alaska last year. We are planning on returning to Alaska in 2020 to complete surveys of the Aleutian Islands. Along the coast, NOAA's National Water Level Observation Network provides long-term observations to inform the decisions of increasingly vulnerable Arctic communities. In cooperation with the Alaska uh, Ocean Observing System, AUS, NOAA is developing portable, low-cost systems to fill uh, information gaps in the Arctic. This will allow the National Weather Service to provide improved storm surge warnings and forecasts in small coastal communities. The scale of the hydrographic surveying requirement in Alaska and the Arctic is vast. Over the past three years, NOAA and its contract partners acquired 1,500 square nautical miles of Arctic survey data. Our survey plans for 2019 include an extensive set of project areas in Kuskokwim Bay. NOAA's 51-year-old survey vessels and our survey contractors are an essential component of the balanced hydrographic survey program NOAA employs in Alaska and across the nation. NOAA continually works with our stakeholders to inform our survey priorities. Our Federal Advisory Committee, the Hydrographic Services Review Panel, convened in Juneau last year in August for just this purpose. The, committee, uh, the CMTS 2015 report on vessel traffic through the Bering Strait predicts that it will increase 500% by 2025 along with the risk of oil and other hazardous material spills. NOAA supports the Coast Guard response by providing oil spill modeling, tools, and data management, including the Arctic Environmental uh, Response Management application, known as IRMA. Last August, NOAA participated in a mutual aid deployment exercise on Alaska's North Slope oil field and provided oil spill response training to over 200 industry and state and federal representatives. With 3% of the Arctic Circle within Alaska, international cooperation is also critical for the success of our efforts. 
NOAA participates in the Arctic Council and its working groups, such as the Protection on the Arctic Marine Environment and Arctic um, Monitoring and Assessment Program. NOAA is also a member of the Sustaining Arctic Observance, uh, Observations Network and the Arctic Regional Hydrographic Commission. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and discuss NOAA's Arctic Marine Navigation and Related Services. I appreciate the subcommittee's time and attention and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Colonel Borders. Thank you, sir. Ad Admiral Smith, thank you very much. We work with NOAA quite often in the Corps of Engineers, especially up in Alaska. In fact, uh, I just received uh, the uh, concurrence to move past design or to move through design uh, with our Whittier study. So thank you. Uh, Chairman Maloney uh, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm Colonel Phil Borders. I'm the commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Alaska District. I actually live just outside of uh, Anchorage, so flew down here to this hot weather. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and discuss navigation needs in the Arctic, particularly the Port of Nome. Today, we'll provide you a quick overview of the Corps' navigation program in Alaska, then focus in upon the pre preliminary conclusions of our soon-to-be-published draft integrated feasibility report and environmental assessment for the Port of Nome modification study, highlighting some of the navigation needs in Western Alaska and the Arctic. As you know, the increased ocean water temperatures, reduction in pack ice, and the longer opening of the Northern Passage, Alaskan and Alaskan ports are of vital interest to our nation and our North American allies. Since 1902, when Congress requested the Corps to perform preliminary examinations of the Wrangell Channel in Southeast Alaska, uh, the Corps has played an important role in addressing navigation needs in the state. In Alaska, few communities are connected to Alaska's limited road system, resulting in ports and harbors playing an important role in statewide transportation and economy. The Corps of Engineers has constructed overall 62 harbors and channel projects in, in, over the last 117 years, with 57 of those 62 still in use today. Recently, construction projects in Alaska in Valdez and Port Lyons along with the nine current navigation studies my district has and the two authorized navigation projects that are ready for design, shows the demand of navigation improvements in Alaska remains strong today. As part, of the program, as part of the Corps' program in Alaska, the district has investigated the need for navigational improvement in the Arctic. In our 2013 report entitled Alaska Deep Draft Arctic Port System, we noted more than 3,000 3, vessels use the Great Circle uh, to transit annually, and each year and there are, all over, or there are over 400 Bering Strait transits annually. Uh, so the opening of the Arctic waters or to maritime traffic is presenting new challenges with respect to maritime safety and environmental protection as well as opportunities for greater efficiencies in shipping. This ability of vessels to transit uh, into, the, in, into and through the Arctic has increased in conjunction with the lengthening of time of open water free ice currently from about May to November. A prime example of the navigation is Nome, Alaska. The Corps' navigation project at Nome was originally completed in 1923 and then expanded in 1954 and again modified in 2006. So we've been at this for a while. Located 737 miles north of Dutch Harbor along the Aleutian chain, Nome is, is the only major port facility in the western and northern Alaska and providing safe, safe freight transfers for vessels in excess of 22, uh, 22 draft-capable facilities. Currently, multiple government vessels, large cruise ships, research vessels, and large fuel tankers conduct lightering into Nome to access necessary facilities to bring both crew and cargo ashore. In total, vessels exceeding the draft depth entered the, the port spent over 1,200 hours in anchor offshore at Nome in 2017 alone just to cut, conduct those lightering operations. Due to the lack of available deep draft along the western and northern coast, the U.S. Coast Guard, as stated earlier, is limited to small vessels and helicopters. The nearest Coast Guard station to Nome is about 800 miles away south in Kodiak, as the Admiral <laughs> mentioned. However, because of the long sailing times of the remote, through remote and often trouble, uh, challenging waters, Security and safety become our, our, our concern of paramount, both for the Coast Guard and for the Corps. Increasing number of oil and gas transport vessels are transiting the Atlantic, making spills a growing concern, mainly because of the limited facilities or ready available supplies should a, should a cleanup happen at sea. In summary, though Nome is not the only community 
uh, in Alaska in need of navigation improvements. The situation in Nome is a good example. Um, we are proud to work in collaboration with many other federal agencies, as we do routinely, and recommend Arctic implementation and needs of the Arctic. Thank you, Mr. Chem Chairman and subcommittee members. Uh, open to your questions, uh, as always. Thank you, Colonel. We'll now proceed to uh, members' questions. Uh, uh, I uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Colonel, can you help me understand um, the subject you were just talking about? Um, what, are, what, are, what is the optimal depth for that port in Nome? Uh, I know we're fortunate enough to be joined by uh, Admiral uh, Allen, who is going to tell us it's, I think, according to your uh, standards, deeper than 22 feet, deeper than the 35 feet they might get to with additional docking. Shouldn't it be 45 feet? Could you talk a little bit about that, sir? Sir, in, in this project, it's a civil works project using the Remote uh, Subsistence Harbor Act of WERDA of 2007. Um, so we've maintained the draft and the study has been upon the vessels that use it and the Coast Guard vessels. So the study is looking forward to between 30 and 40 uh, MLLW, mean lower, low water, or uh, for, the, for the study that we have out there. Um, I understand the 45-foot the depth, uh, but that's for uh, another organization if they, if they want to have that capability there for the Arleigh Burke class, I believe, is what you're referring to, sir. And, and so, so if, if I could just press you on that a little bit, what, what, what does that answer mean that you just, could you put that into terms that a normal human could understand? So the community of Nome, sir, and the shipping vessels that are up there, it's the assessment of the vessels that use that facility normally, and that's where we come up with it between the 30 and the 40. Right, but we've got a dynamic situation, don't we, Colonel? You'd agree the, the whole point of what we're talking about today is the emerging uh, re-examination of the Arctic, of developing a strategic plan, of keeping up with the great power competition. Um, it's not going to be enough to just service the vessels who are using it now. Isn't that fair to say? I mean... You know, do we have any other deep water ports anywhere nearby? No, sir. There's Port Clarence. Which That's is natural, it, right? Natural, natural deep water with no facilities. You're not considering associated. Port Clarence, am I right? So it's the only one we're considering, right, is, is, is Nome? So it's the one that we've, over the last three studies, has come to the conclusion that Nome is the best viable port with a benefit-cost ratio that also supports the community because we're using a civil works authority to do this. And so if we want to have a port, that's going to be it. And if we want to have a port we can actually use into the future with all the capabilities we want to develop and we're going to spend a lot of taxpayer money on, it's got to be deeper than 22 feet, deeper than 35 feet, doesn't it? For national defense reasons, sir, I think that you're correct. For 45 feet would be the optimal. But once again, this is we're doing this under a civil works premise right now and under the authorities of the Corps has. So I'm... Um, we do a lot of MILCON work. Um, we're just currently not using that for this uh, particular project. Uh, I understand. Thanks. Um, and uh, no, I appreciate I appreciate your point, but uh, I also think you appreciate the larger point, uh, which we're we're paid to focus on, at least on this side of the dais. Uh, Admiral Smith, can you tell me a little bit about um, what your what your challenges are in the Arctic, what your uh, infrastructure needs are? Obviously, it's a vast region. Um, the extraordinary work you do in other places simply hasn't been possible in that region. I understand that. Can you put some context around that for us and, and what we ought to be thinking about, what we ought to expect, um, what you'd need to really bring it up to the same kind of standards we enjoy in other places? Uh, yes, sir. Most of our work uh, for hydrographic surveys in the Arctic for shipborne work has been staged out of Dutch Harbor uh, using Nome as a sort of forward operating base when it is accessible to us. Uh, and and you know, as a result the, uh, of that and the vast distances that we've talked about earlier, there's a very short uh, operational season available to us for surveying. Uh, and so the, so the two ships that we have and our contractors have to cram a whole season's worth of activities into that short window. Um, we have, uh, recognizing this challenge, we're looking at ways of, of, uh, of hitting that area as hard as we can with as many platforms as we can during that short season. Uh, so to that end, we're looking at unmanned systems with, that are independent with high endurance, uh, ship-based unmanned systems that can, that can uh, sort of be a force multiplier for our existing ships and future ships, um, and increased use of, of partnerships and crowdsourcing uh, 
uh, for, the, for the region. Uh, all of those together are still not going to be enough because it's, it's such a huge challenge. Uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're being very creative with all of the technology and, and resources available to us. Emily, we also heard Admiral Ray talk about how everything's harder in the Arctic. Could you say a word about how you track ice movement, ice flows, oil spills potentially, and, uh, and the additional challenges you have there? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, very briefly, uh, you know, this is a, the Ice Center is a is a is an inter is an interagency effort uh, with with NOAA and and the Navy um, and and the Coast Guard for for uh, you know different different parts of the program. Um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of satellite observations, aircraft observations, um, and 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 that that tracking has been consistent over time. The, the oil spill response is particularly tricky because we rely on, on, on modeling, um, which itself is then relying on, on observations and, uh, and mapping, which is, which is sparse in the Arctic. Um, so we're investing in science uh, for understanding the, the, the behavior of, of, of oil in that type of environment, as well as in the modeling necessary to support it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a lighter, start out with a little bit of a lighter note. Uh, I guess uh, Captain Cook surveyed Alaska in 1778, and uh, hopefully some of that survey data has been upgraded, updated since then. You don't have to answer that. Just, um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, 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 uh, the charts and the survey, and, and um, uh, you know, what actions can NOAA uh, take, to, Admiral, to complete surveys and processes the data from those surveys that get those are navigable? Navigationally significant areas are to charge more quickly, and I, I'm going to tie this in a little bit with this uh, other uh, concept or process called the continuously operating reference system or CORS. Um, uh, you know, the coastal mapping with the Army Corps and uh, NOAA does how they, they, they play together, how do you interact? And uh, I guess the two questions that come out of that really: Does NOAA coordinate coastal mapping requirements and survey operations with the U.S. Army Corps engineers? The National Coastal Mapping Program, and also um, you tell the committee how this is important in NOAA's mission, but geographic data more generally. Because um, I've, I've kind of heard that sometimes we, our coast change on the maps. Is that, and maybe you can explain this, this whole area of, of how we develop these charts and how we can do it better and, and more efficiently. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I understand the first question to be about the process of, of, of taking from observation until it's useful to the, to the public. Um, I'm pleased to report that we've made huge progress on that in the last, in the last decade or so. This has been a, a personal passion of mine. Um, and that has, that has it's resulted, uh, the, the improvement has, has been a result of both processing improvements in hydrographic surveying but also changes in the way that we update our charts and distribute them. And in fact, it's the charting changes that have probably led to the most, most notable improvement in this. So instead of waiting for a new edition of a paper chart to be printed, distributed to warehouses, and then sent out to customers, we're entirely digital now, and, and all charts are print on demand. So when a change, when, when a new survey comes in, we can update it on the chart, and it can be available next Thursday. Um, so it, so the, 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 the holdover from being a print shop is now gone, and that's cut years off of the, off of the, the time it takes to update charts. Um, the continually operating reference uh, systems are GPS-based uh, reference systems that are very dense in the continental U.S. They're largely partnerships, uh, and so where there's any infrastructure, university or other federal agencies, we tend to have these. Um, this is one where, uh, because there's thinner communities and less activity in general, we have less in, in Alaska. Um, but I, I am pleased to report that the, the National Geodetic Survey has a foundation cores program um, that, that I know we'll be hearing more about soon that, that will uh, provide the underlying highest order uh, positioning system that, to underline the, the, underlie the, the uh, 2022 datum changes. Um, coordinate with the Army Corps, absolutely, um, uh, both uh, for the channel, uh, channel programs, channel dredging, that's where most of the data comes from, but also for the coastal mapping program from the, uh, from the, the Joboltex system uh, run out of Mississippi and, and, and there, are, there are other programs around the country. 
We have 100% interoperability, that is we can use the data when necessary. Um, we also do coordinate uh, knowing what each other's plans are so that we can meet each other's needs as we, as we go forward. Um, so uh, we don't always use the data because it's not always relevant, but, but we do have available uh, uh, full interoperability. Um, and that really ties into the coastal change as well, so that okay. we, um, in, in particularly with, uh, with less ice in Alaska, there's, there's more erosion of the coastline, and we're seeing more coastal change. Uh, and with larger scale charts, that sort of change is more relevant and, and, and easier okay. Okay. to detect. I appreciate it. I'm glad to hear that you're working together in that. Yes, uh, Colonel, um, we're told that the, the Chief's report for the Port of Nome modification study of the fall of 2019 is there any changes to that schedule and, and as a core encompassing expected national security and other associated benefits in their evaluation of the Arctic deep draft port? Sir, uh, we don't anticipate any change. In fact, we anticipate achieved support uh, in June of uh, 2020 for the report. So we're, we're on schedule um, um, for that. Uh, I believe the second part of your question was uh, about national security or other so we, we do we do we have include national security in this report structure um, uniquely enough uh, so there is a currently no metric in our in our process to address that but we are addressing that as far as being in the report so that like the chairman had spoke to earlier that it can be it can be looked at in the larger perspective um, outside of the authority that we're, we're looking at this project with. I know, I know we got a challenge, but it's really the only possibility of having a deep water port in that area, right? So, That's my understanding, you know, sir. And the challenge it's the best is, chance, sir. Yeah, and the challenge is getting the, the draft deep enough. Right. Sir. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Smith, uh, in your testimony, uh, you talk about the need for strategic uh, partnerships and increased capabilities to ensure a steady stream of data and accurate information for sea ice and weather forecasts. The National Ice Center, which is located in my district in Suitland, Maryland, uh, is one of those strategic partnerships uh, between NOAA, the Navy, and the Coast Guard. Um, can you just talk a little bit about um, the Ice Center and uh, the value of that data and what it means uh, for um, operations in the Arctic? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I'll do my best, and, and if I don't meet your needs, I can, uh, I can do, we can get follow-up information to you. Um, so the, the ICE Center provides operational forecasts and, and conditions that are, that are suitable for marine navigation. Uh, it's one of a suite of services that we provide to, 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 uh, that, that supports uh, shipping uh, services, marine navigation in general. Um, it's, it's, you know, heavily used, uh, of course, for military, commercial, recreational, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and other, and other services. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the, I mean, I think that's the, that's the, that's the glossy. In my district, you say something nice about it, and then they all feel good that, yes, uh, that they're being, uh, um, you know, acknowledged for their good work. So thank, thank you very much. And if I could also just say that there's a, that, that, that three he, the three agency cooperation for an operational program like that is unusual and, and really, really noteworthy, and, uh, and we're really pleased to be part of that. Great. Well, thanks. Um, Colonel uh, Borders, uh, in your testimony, at least in your written testimony, uh, you point out that the Corps of Engineers has improved channels at 62 ports in Alaska and that 57 of those are still in use today. Uh, with the increasingly ice-free conditions in the Arctic, uh, what are some of the things we can do better uh, to increase our capacity in the Arctic and improve efficiency at our ports? So a lot of it, sir, is, is, is getting in the studies. So down here in the lower 48, excuse the colloquialism, but uh, a lot of the environmental studies, the marine mammal studies, uh, the endangered species studies, they're easy to gather. They're quickly gathered because the data is over and over years. But when I had the mayor of Kotzebue in my office and we did our, one of our, our civil works milestones, the agency decision milestones, so Mayor Smith, uh, Eugene was in there and he got a brief with me. And he said, literally to get this, so we have the information we can give to NOAA and we can, so they can make the right decision, we're gonna have to put a fisherman or a fisher person on that dock to count the number of ring seals that go by. The data just doesn't exist. So some of it is, is collecting and learning more I think is the best answer, sir. So what do you need from Congress to help you with that? 
Right now, sir, we just need the, the studies that we have to continue to be funded and supported. Uh, I would say that outside of that, maybe I'm speaking outside of my lane a little bit, but for NOAA and other agencies to have the ability to conduct some more broad-based studies in Alaska so that data is more openly, readily available. Uh, so when we get to ready to build something, we can build it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, uh, without... Uh Seeing no other members who might have questions, I'm going to thank the gentlemen for their testimony. We do have a third panel, so I'm going to try to move uh, ahead with this. Uh, thank you both very much. Let's go to the third panel. Well, thank you all for being here. Without, uh, without further delay, I'd like to move now to our final panel of witnesses. Um, we're joined today by Admiral Thad Allen, U.S. Coast Guard, retired co-author on the Council Foreign Relations Report, Arctic Imperatives, Reinforcing U.S. Strategy on America's Fourth Coast. Uh, Ms. Heather A. Conley, Senior Vice President for the Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic for the Center of Strategic and International Studies. Dr. Abby Tingstad, uh, Senior Physical Scientist for the RAND Corporation, uh, and the Honorable Mead Treadwell, co-author of the Polar Institute Advisory Board for the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you all for being here today. We look forward to your testimony. Um, without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. As with the previous panels, um, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony uh, to five minutes. I'm going to start with you, Admiral. Uh, Alan, thank you for uh, thank you all for being patient and for for uh, for allowing us to uh, to get through the other panels first. Um, in particular, Admiral Allen, I want to thank you very much for your four decades of service to uh, to the country. We we respect very much your service to the Coast Guard, your work during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, of course, Deepwater Horizon, and I've read the um, I've read the report you co-authored uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations and. Uh, it's a terrific piece of work. I know it's been I know it's been out there for two years, and uh, but we are very thankful for you for your presence today. I want to give you an opportunity to um, to highlight for us the importance of some of the issues you raised in that report. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman Maloney, uh, Ranking Member Gibbs, other members of the committee, and I saw some old friends here that are no longer in the room. I'll try and reach out and touch them at another time. Uh, pleased to be here with my distinguished colleagues all of you had a lot to add to the uh, testimony today, and I'd like to comment on the Corps of Engineers and NOAA. Uh, their testimony, as you know, was uh, to the point, but uh, incredible support provided to me during the hurricanes and the oil spill response and uh, my entire service in the Coast Guard. Uh, for the record, I'm here today testifying in my personal capacity, not representing any entity. And I used to say when I was uh, giving speeches that I'm gonna be frank and honest because I'm retired, my pension's assured. I can only tell you today that I'm retired. <laughs> in uh, 2016, as you noted, I was honored to uh, co-lead an independent task force sponsored by the uh, Council on Foreign Relations that issued a report entitled Arctic Imperatives, Reinforcing U.S. Strategy on America's Fourth Coast. The report developed recommendations for policymakers to consider in the presidential transition process, as you noted, in 2016. 
I'm going to summarize the key findings of that report, and the full report is available, and I've recommended to the staff it be appended to the uh, report of the, of the hearing, sir. Without objection. Uh, as stated in the report, uh, the Arctic is a crossroads of international politics and a forewarning for the world. The United States, through Alaska, is a significant Arctic nation with strategic, economic, and scientific interests. As sea ice continues to melt, countries inside and outside the Arctic region have updated their strategic and commercial calculations to take advantage of the changing conditions stemming from the opening of the region. The United States needs to increase its strategic commitment to the region or risk leaving its interests unprotected. Uh, the task force organized its work into four interrelated areas, U.S. policy, U.S. national security, economic energy and environmental issues, and finally, Alaska and Alaska natives. We consulted broadly and support a comprehensive integrated approach in assessing future options in the Arctic. That approach includes sustaining international partnerships, as was noted by Admiral Ray, the Arctic Council, International Maritime For Forum, excuse me, International Maritime Organization and the uh, Coast Guard Arctic Forum. The task force identified six main goals the U.S. policymakers should pursue to protect the United States' growing economic and strategic interests in the Arctic. First, ratify the U.N. Convention of the Law of the Sea. The Senate should help secure the United States' legal rights to more than 386,000 square miles of subsea resources along ex extended continental shelf by ratifying this treaty. MRA talked about rules-based operations in Alaska. This is the overarching global governance strategy for this globe, and in my view, uh, the United States should be ashamed it hasn't ratified it yet. I'm retired. Uh, fund and maintain polar icebreakers. Uh, we recommended six. I won't get into that because it's been uh, detailed fairly uh, significantly in the hearing to date. Improve Arctic infrastructure, invest in telecommunications, energy, and other infrastructure in Alaska, and find locations for safe harbor ports and a deep water port. Three, strengthen cooperation with other Arctic nations, continue diplomatic efforts with the Arctic Council and to work with other Arctic states, including Russia, on confidence building and cooperative security measures. I would add, continuing cooperation with Russia is vital, and the Coast Guard has done that through my entire career and needs to continue to do that, regardless of the larger security uh, environment that we're operating in. And finally, fund scientific research, sustain budget support for scientific research beyond 2017 to understand the regional and global impact of accelerated change. I'm going to omit my other comments because they've been covered by other folks. I would like to go to just maybe just one comment to close with. It's in, in response to Admiral Ray's comments about peer competitors. Uh, there's an old saying that I wish I could attribute to an author, but I can't, unfortunately. And the quote is, you don't have sovereignty unless you can exert it. Our peer competitors understand that, that about the Arctic and are demonstrating strategic intent with their current actions. In the United States, we spend more time arguing about who understands the climate better. Before I retired from the Coast Guard, I was asked by a member of Congress about my opinion on global warming. I responded there was water where there didn't used to be and I was responsible for it. It's time to understand that we're all responsible for the Arctic and this planet. I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Connolly. Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, thank you so much for this kind invitation to testify before you this afternoon. And thank you for your thoughtful work for many years related to strengthening America's capabilities in the Arctic. I actually really appreciate the title of this hearing, as there is a cost to doing nothing, and there's also a cost for taking action. I thought since my written testimony is already placed into record that I would just do, uh, provide a few moments of reflection on Secretary Pompeo's, uh, I think, groundbreaking speech on Monday in Finland, um, and then to just offer some ideas uh, for your consideration. Although, uh, Secretary Pompeo's speech against the backdrop of the Arctic Council was perhaps a, a misplaced uh, moment because the Arctic Council does not deal with hard security, nor does it really deal with economic issues. I think it's an important moment that a senior U.S. government official has now stated that we are in a new age of strategic engagement in the Arctic. This is not new news to this committee, but I think it is new that it's been articulated. But as I note in my written testimony, we fall again into a trap of our own making by describing what our competitors are doing, and that in some way substitute, substitutes for what we are not doing. So we can talk about Russia's 41 icebreakers, 
But we need six. We can talk about uh, the 16 deep water ports that uh, perhaps uh, Russia may have, but we just need one. Um, we need to have more flexible, capable forces and assets that can operate in ice-covered waters and can fight in cold weather. So my suggestion, and it came to me as I was listening to the, to the testimony, is quite frankly, we do need an operational plan. I would argue along the lines, and I, I closely follow uh, U.S. force posture in Europe and NATO, we need something akin to the European, it was first called the Reassurance Initiative, it went to the European Deterrence Initiative, and now it's the European Defense Initiative. What happened? U.S. had withdrawn forces from Europe, and then the annexation of Crimea and the incursion into the Donbass occurred. And all of a sudden, we had to get very focused and have a dedicated spending on air, land, and maritime component to make our forces re more robust. I would argue we need an Arctic sovereignty initiative. It needs to work both with the Coast Guard and with the Navy. It needs to be multi-year and dedicated. We have to take the urgency of great power competition in the Arctic and move forward with actual spending. What I've heard is a lots of conversation about what we should do. We have to put the imperative of what we will do. And again, it's not about what our competitors are doing. It is about what the U.S. must do to protect its security interests in the Arctic. Again, just uh, two um, more or three more brief reflections on Secretary Pompeo's speech. He noted that respect and transparency are the price of admission in the Arctic. Well, I would probably rephrase that, and I would say that it, it's respect for international law and norms, which is the price for stability, security, environmental protection, and prosperity in the Arctic. So we, right now, everyone is respecting international law, uh, but we don't have transparency. We have a lack of transparency of why Russia is constructing very sophisticated air bases with surface-to-air missiles and, and developing new and exercising new um, uh, Arctic-specific equipment. We don't have transparency on what China is doing in their observation centers or in their infrastructure development. Norms and Arctic code of conduct and greater confidence building measures are needed. Secretary Pompeo also alerted us to the differences in the maritime legal interpretations of the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route. This is important, but lumping Canada and Russia into the same bucket, I think, is incorrect. We have an, an ally uh, and a, a NATO partner that we share protection of North America and NORAD. We have a difference of opinion. We, we manage that opinion. Russia's difference of opinion is a slightly different uh, issue. But again, we have to look at this in context. The reason that we don't have a major issue right now with that legal interpretation is because the traffic has been so minimal in the Northern Sea Route. In 2018, there were 27 full transits through the Northern Sea Route. We haven't really raised this issue, quite frankly, because it hasn't been used that much. And I suspect that the Northern Sea Route is not the primary uh, interest for the Chinese. It is the transpolar or central passage that is of, of importance to them. I don't believe they're going to pay those port fees in the future. So I just, one closing comment that I have, and that's our, our work at the Arctic Council. The U.S. position on the Arctic Council and the declaration, unfortunately, gave the, uh, had the unique result of having Russia and China sound more like environmental advocates and working more harmoniously with our own allies than the U.S. We have to effectively use these vehicles, whether it's the International Maritime Organization or the Arctic Council, uh, to shape the influence we, we want. When the U.S. walks away from these uh, institutions, we cede influence and power to our competitors. We have to stop kicking our own goals and get busy working on developing America's capabilities in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conley. Uh, Dr. Fingstead. Am I, saying your name, am I saying your name correctly, doctor? You are, sir. Thanks, thank you. Dave. Go ahead, ma'am. Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon. The three main points I would like to leave the committee with today are, one of the greatest concerns that has emerged in my research are incidents that might, might imperil safety, bring military or other assets together in escalatory ways, or release toxins into the environment in the Arctic. The second point is that, 
Although there are many factors that will impact future outcomes in the Arctic, cooperation at all levels, including issues to do with geopolitics, and governance will be among the most influential. And third, mitigating capability gaps to enable safety, security, and stewardship activities will help enable U U.S. governance in the Arctic, but will require investing in organizations and people, as well as in multiple types of assets and infrastructure. There is no silver technology or other bullet. The solution, whatever the specifics, will be multifaceted. I'll return to each of these points briefly in the remainder of my time. First, the importance of discrete events. One of the primary findings from the research I referred to in my written testimony was the concern of stakeholders writ large about safety, risk of escalation stemming from marginal incidents, and the containment and mitigation of environmental hazards. In addition to the immediate concern about loss of life and property, among other things, um, these types of events have the potential in the future to cause a chain reaction, leading to general issues of rising tensions, perhaps between stakeholders, as well as the creation or perception of a security and governance void in the Arctic region. This will naturally impact indigenous and other local communities. It will impact the role of the US Coast Guard, and it could lead to increased involvement or even assertiveness from individual Arctic stakeholders to include Russia and China. Let me pause for a minute on Russia and China. Um, one of the other aspects of our work has been looking at the durability of um, Arctic cooperation. Naturally, Russian assertiveness in the Arctic and the emergence of China as a long-term player in the region has raised questions about the durability of this cooperation, forgetting ahead of governance and other issues, something I touch upon momentarily. The United States and others are right to be wary of Russian and Chinese activity in the Arctic, but must be mindful of some important points. First of all, Russia and China do not have identical history, stakes, or interests in the region. Russia's confidence in the efficacy of the protective ice barrier for its long, strategically and economic, economically important northern rim is understandably waning. In contrast, China does not hold any territory in the Arctic. It is, of course, one of 13 Arctic Council permanent observer states, um, and as such has participated by the Council's rules and in the spirit of cooperation uh, thus far. That said, the economic and military resources uh, at China's disposal make it a very powerful stakeholder. And there is no doubt that China seeks investment and influence in the region. Whether China's near Arctic state concept will catch on with others, creating the potential for a negotiating bloc also remains on the horizon. Returning to cooperation and governance as two important factors among many in influencing the vulnerability of the Arctic to safety and security incidents, these decisions that, that uh, Arctic stakeholders make about these as a, as a group and individually will shape activity in the Arctic and affect the resources required and available to govern that activity. This is very important for demands on the maritime transportation system and the transportation system writ large, I would argue, in the Arctic, and on the U.S. Coast Guard in terms of what the service does, when, where, how often, and in what intensity. I'll conclude by talking about the, the third point I raised, which is about um, U.S. Coast Guard capability gaps in the Arctic. And what we found in our research was that there are three main types of gaps, communications and navigation, um, maritime and other domain awareness, as well as response capabilities. Um, some specific recommendations that uh, came out, out of our study included installing additional communications infrastructure. Admiral Ray talked a little bit about that earlier. Also investing in remotely controlled air, sea, and amphibious craft for providing persistent wide area surveillance updating data gathering and database construction processes to enhance the role of automation, in developing operating concepts plans, and investment strategies that recognize the need for both agile first response assets as well as infrastructure and logistics to sustain longer term operations and to conduct heavy lifting. Increasing the number of forward operating locations and resources, including local and mobile elements as well as continuing um, improving long-term relationships with native communities and pre-positioning key response art items in those partner communities. I'll conclude by reiterating once again that any uh, mitigating strategy will involve a multifaceted approach. Part of good governance is being equipped to prevent and mitigate problems by making the right investments in organizations and people, as well as in multiple assets and infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tingstead. Uh, Governor Treadwell. Thank you for joining us. You may proceed. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman Maloney, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Gibbs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I 
believe I first testified before this committee during the consideration of Open 90 when I was a, a, a local government official. I was working uh, to, to help make sure we had the infrastructure after a major oil spill. Uh, in the early 2000s, as a, a commissioner on the Arctic Research Commission, was the first of several times I've been before this committee to say we needed icebreakers. Uh, working with uh, uh, Admiral Allen when he was commandant uh, uh, to try to help make that happen. It's good to see it happening today, and thank you for your continuing attention on this issue. As you wrap up batter today, let me just talk about the issue of how do you actually get the infrastructure we need in the Arctic. And I've got three basic ideas that I wanted to share with you. I want to make sure that it's understood that these are my ideas or the opinions that I express are my own, not the Wilson Center. I do co-chair the Polar Program at the Wilson Center, and uh, we are holding a major symposium with the National Ice Center and the U.S. Arctic Research Commission in July, uh, to which you are all invited. But uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that we're, you're constantly being asked to appropriate funds for Arctic infrastructure. And whether it's icebreakers uh, or uh, that might be justified by security or economic development, uh, the problem that I see is that our security plans, our civil plans, our commercial plans all identify the need for the same thing, ports, charting, communications. But we still have stovepipes that don't really work together to figure out how to pay it. Now, we do have CMTS, which is a cross-government effort to look at the marine transportation system, but it doesn't include the state government, which can bring significant resources to the table as well. And I want to appreciate the work that CMTS has done uh, in the Arctic, but I just want to say we need to get away from this. And a couple of examples. When you heard the Coast Guard say today that we have floating bases with these new, uh, with these new icebreakers, that's, that's tremendous but it's leaving the civil authorities who need to finance ports to kind of act on their own. And we really should be working together to get the military, uh, uh, the security issues covered, as well as the civil and commercial issues covered. Uh, when you heard the question on telecommunications, the same issue, uh, uh, I, I chair an advisory board for Iridium. We've got 66 new satellites operating, a 360 by 360 process that works and serves the military. And this is something where the commercial needs and the security needs can be answered together. The second point I want to make is that when it comes to finding revenue, especially to pay for icebreakers, when the Admiral and I were serving together, it cost something between 60 and $80 million a year to run our icebreaker program. Now, the Russians are charging half a million dollars to go across the Arctic Ocean per ship. Uh, so to make up $80 million is 160 ships. That's one ship a day during the open navigation season. All right. Uh, Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan have proposed a bill which the Wilson Center has worked on. I worked on developing it as chair of the Arctic Circle uh, Mission Council on Shipping and Ports, which says let's create an Arctic Seaway Development Corporation very similar to the St. Lawrence Seaway Corporation, which exists in, in Congressman Gibbs' district. And the St. Lawrence Seaway approach uh, would, has, several nation, has two nations working together. We could have several nations working together in the Arctic to put together a seamless uh, system to get people across the Arctic Ocean. And that concept is uh, well described in S1177, but Mr. Chairman, I guess I'd put it this way. Uh, when we come ask you for money for icebreakers and talk about inbound Arctic shipping, it's not really American taxpayers' job so, to pay the bill so China can sell goods to France. It's our job to set up a system so that tariffs and revenue can come in to help pay for those icebreakers, and that's the concept in that legislation. Mr. Chairman, finally, the third thing I'd like to say in terms of paying for Arctic infrastructure is it's a lot easier to pay something for something when there's more economic activity. Now, there was a large push during... Uh, uh, the Bush and the Obama administrations to make OCS uh, drilling work offshore. There was expectations that that was going to help pay for the major ports in the Arctic. It didn't happen uh, for, for whatever reasons, and we can discuss those. But I, I would predict that the next big wave of economic activity, the Russians have already shown us how to do. They're bringing 16.5 million tons of LNG from Yamal through the Bering Strait, 2,600 miles through the ice, to get there while well, we've got big fields at Prudhoe Bay and the Canadians have a big field at the McKinsey Delta that are lying fallow. Now, if, if this is not something that requires congressional appropriation, but it does require congressional and diplomatic attention. 
And with that opportunity, I predict that sometime in the, by the end of the next decade, you're going to see maybe as much as 50 million tons a year of LNG moving out of Russia, maybe as much as 30 to 40 million tons of LNG a year moving out of Alaska and, and the Canadian uh, McKinsey Delta. And I believe that relatively benign economic activity, which, you gotta, uh, which has a lower carbon impact than, than some of the fuels being used in Asia today, uh, is, is going to help bring the economic activity necessary to pay for the infrastructure. So I would just urge you to pay attention. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, before we proceed to members' questions, uh, yes, I'd ask uh, unanimous consent uh, that uh, Mr. Graves of Louisiana uh, be allowed to join the panel for the purposes of uh, participating in today's hearing uh, without objection. Uh, now proceed to members' questions. Um, yield myself, uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Emma Allen and um, Ms. Connolly, I'm, I'm interested in following up on your comments about asserting sovereignty in the Arctic. I take your point, Admiral, about, you know, you have sovereignty where you can assert it. What does that look like in the Arctic? And help us understand the gap between, I take it you don't think we can now, uh, what, what does it look like? Um, and same question to you, Ms. Connolly or Tanya, the members of the panel. Kind of depends on where you sit. <clears throat> I've had a lot of conversations with my counterparts, especially the Chief of Naval Operations when I was the Commandant. From a U.S. security standpoint and Navy missions, subsurface capability and capacity meets their mission set from where they sit. Uh, but as Admiral Ray was discussing, if you have an event in the Arctic and you don't have a platform there to operate from, command and control communications uh, beyond what the current infrastructure is up there, you're not going to get it there in time to be meaningful or impactful. Therefore, in my view, in terms of non-submarine missions not related uh, to DOD, right now I would say there is a lack of sovereignty. In Alaska, and we need to be truthful about it. And with the recommend, same question to you, Ms. Conley, but but please be specific as well in terms of I, I've read the recommendations from the from the report. Would do those cover it? Are there other things that that sovereignty looks like? Um, please give us your thoughts. Uh, Chairman, thank you so much. I mean, what we're talking about is a whole of government approach. And what's been sort of unfair is that we've placed this burden on the Coast Guard because they are the leading force that provides that law enforcement sovereign presence in the Arctic. But they're one important element of a wider array. We need a stronger diplomatic presence in all of the Arctic uh, countries. We can put Russia aside for a moment because of the, the current challenges. Uh, this is exactly what uh, Congressman Gallagher was saying about our presence in Greenland. We need a, a bigger science presence. Right now, China's opening up scientific observatory centers. We are a science power in the Arctic. We need to increase our sovereign presence. But on this security nexus, we need to think about increasing the forward operating locations, not simply Kodiak, but additional. We need, what's concerning me about Admiral Ray's testimony is that so many of the assets he was talking about, I don't believe we're really going to be destined for the Arctic. They are available, but they won't be there on a persistent presence beyond just the seasonal. Right now, we practice in the summer season. We have to have a persistent, permanent presence. This will take the Navy, quite frankly, the Navy's strategy to me was quite disappointing. It did not talk about ice-strengthened surface vessels. We got banged around in Trident Juncture in good weather. Uh, we need a surface fleet capable of, of persistent presence. We need the helicopters, we need the communications, it is a plan, and we have to exercise that plan. So it's a whole of government strategy. Appreciate that. Would you say a word on, um, and again, Tanya, the panel, but uh, on the deep water port issue, help me understand the challenges and the needs and related to what we just talked about. If I can just offer, we have to get out of the mode of studying and doing. We study things in lieu of action. Like where are you going with this? We Ms. have Connelly. to, and this is join with, joining with the private sector, but we have to make the decision to do it. And I don't know how Congress can move that forward, but we are going to be 10 more years studying the matter, and we have to start doing it. And that's where this whole of government Arctic sovereignty initiative, where there's incentive by the government to then help the private sector join in that cooperation. Then I'll be quiet, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, we, you're, you're here to testify, so 
Go ahead and testify. Yes, sir. Well, I see Mr. Graves is in the room, so uh, maybe I'll comment on how the Army Corps of Engineers scopes projects. <laughs> and maybe I'm practicing law without a license or out, out of my lane here. Uh, but their authorization language and their appropriation language stove pipes projects. I think what the Colonel was trying to say, given the authorization they had, the report is going to detail what they can do. And getting back to Heather's comments, we need to be thinking about what is a whole of government response and what are we going to need up there in the future. And the 22 feet at Nome and what they can actually do, whether it's extending the pier or dredging, is not going to get us to a point where we will have the flexibility to bring the draft vessels we need in to give us extended presence up there. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you take a look at the Bering Strait, the Russians have got a beautiful port at Providenia just across the Bering Strait. We can't rely on that. Uh, we have a natural deep water port at Port Clarence, and we have uh, a port at Nome that is, is already doing work. Port Clarence needs a road. Uh, Nome needs dredging. Together, you're talking about a system of ports, which is about a $300 million problem. And if, if we can find $300 million, uh, we'll do it. Now, one of the reasons why I talk about a system to generate revenue is if you go to Cold Bay, Alaska, a wide-body jet probably lands there once a year. But we keep it plowed 300 uh, all year. We keep it ready because it's the one port of refuge for an aircraft going between uh, going across the Pacific. We need to understand that if we can create a revenue source from this new Arctic traffic, we're going to be able to have the money to come and pay for some of this infrastructure. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gibbs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm very intrigued by, by the comments here. Uh, Admiral, um, You've been around a long time, um, seen the capabilities, what's happened from 10 years ago and what's happening. Are, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you uh, regard to the, what, uh, the growing Arctic our capabilities versus the increased maritime activity in the Arctic and um, in which is over the Coast Guard's responsibility? So can you just elaborate what you've seen? Are we making progress or not? How are we doing? Well, <clears throat> to cover the same ground that Heather raised, but what happens is we've separated functional capability and mission by the authorization and appropriation that individual agencies get. And neither of those individually by agency are enough to address the comprehensive integrated approach you need in the Arctic. That's the reason this notion of a comprehensive uh, campaign plan or a larger view of the of the area up there is probably going to be necessary because nobody can afford to have their budgets earmarked. I'm certainly the Coast Guard is not going to want their budget earmarked to improve the Port of Nome. So everybody's going to be trying to optimize what they can within their jurisdiction and the capabilities they require to execute their mission. The issue is if you add all those up, they don't come up with a comprehensive integrated plan. And I think uh, I would agree with Heather Conley. I think we're in alignment on this. That's what's called for. Um, I guess to follow that a little bit, we took a lot of discussion about Nome. Uh, I kind of got the impression that's the only option, but then I hear about the challenges of getting the, uh, the port deep enough. Uh, are, are, is there other areas we should be looking at, even though there might not be a population? Or is there other things kind of looking outside the box that maybe Nome's not the place to have it? Mr. Gibbs, uh, through, through the chair, the, uh, there is a natural deep water port of refuge at Port Clarence, which is uh, a fairly short road connection from Nome. Uh, if, if a road could go in that, that uh, area where the Coast Guard had Loran stations, where there's, there's some power capability left behind, where it may be used to support a graphite mine is available. Uh, the proponents of that port and Nome are working together and look at this really as a system of ports. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, the people are in Nome, which it may be better to work with both. But uh, that, that uh, deep water port or has been used since the 1840s uh, by, by ships going in where they couldn't come into Nome and there's an exposure. So there's a reason to, to work together with those ports. Okay, and, that, and go ahead, Admiral. And, and, and just, just one other thing. Uh, the Admiral addressed the issue of the, of the uh, Corps of Engineers' authorities. Uh, I did a lot of work on the Port Clarence Nome issue uh, over the last four or five years, and the the core, because there is no port now collecting revenue, they they can expand a port, but they can't really. Uh, the law doesn't contemplate frontier ports; it really needs to. Uh, they can't really look at the security issues that they need to look at. 
and uh, that's a challenge for both both Nome and Port Clarence. Now this other port, uh, you say it's a deep water port naturally? Yes, sir. It's interesting. Evan, did you, did you make? I, I would just add that uh, you can build a deep water port, but it may be more expensive to build a road to it. So you have to look at the entire system. Okay. A surface rail, what's going on with permafrost, how, how do you actually construct an artery to get to the port? That's the reason this, this all has to be integrated. Okay. Now, uh, in some of the questions or testimony you talked about in the Bering Strait, uh, you know, especially China, I think Ms. Connolly talked about they want to do the transpolar route, which would, would shorten it, but you got to get through a lot more ice. Uh, but how do we get collect revenues? Did I hear somebody mention something about a tariffs or, or possibility? Who, who was that? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Senate has a bill pending, Senate Bill 1177, which is called the SEAL Act, introduced by Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan, and Senator King from Maine. Uh, the bill essentially creates a Seaway Development Corp Corporation, which is modeled on the legislation that created the St. Lawrence Seaway in your district. Uh, it sets up a system to go, uh, to go out and work with other nations to use the icebreaker capabilities across the Arctic, really across the world, to offer a reliable service in the Arctic and to charge a tariff for it. Now, as, as if you read the Secretary's speech uh, in, in Finland the other day, he criticizes Russia for demanding a $500,000 or so tariff uh, uh, for use of the Northern Sea Route. Uh, that tariff is, is paid by people because the route does save the money and it saves them more than $500,000. Yeah. Uh, the concept here is set it up voluntary. Uh, the insurance industry has set up a best practices forum at the Arctic Council and set this up as a best practice and see if you could collect some money. And I would just put it this way. The Suez Canal uses about, uh, serves about 18,000 ships a year. 5% of that is 900 ships. 900 ships paying $500,000 is $450 million a year, and that can cover the operational needs of a lot of icebreakers. And so the concept is to do what the United States did with St. Lawrence. Uh, we don't charge a tariff, the Canadians do, but we work together to have a seamless system. It's similar to the concept of ComSat, where we created uh, the international satellite system and, uh, and to, to bring the world together to offer a seamless service. Uh, just quick, quick, Mr. Chairman, Won't they, to do that, would you have to have, you'd have to have a two-year agreement with Russia uh, for the Bering Strait? Well, uh, I, I was one, Mr. Uh, uh, Congressman, who worked to try to get this this system. The Coast Guard announced where we have the traffic system with Russia in the Bering Strait, and I believe it's important that we cooperate with Russia. Uh, but one of the things this does is it develops a revenue source that helps us pay for the additional infrastructure we need. And, uh, uh, you know, the Russians right now have the de facto monopoly on ship services in the Arctic. Their plans have been done by international consulting companies for see something like a billion dollar a year ship services market supporting ships going across the Arctic. And the U.S. is sitting on its hands. And that's why this legislation has been introduced. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Conley. In West Virginia, our economy relies very heavily on international exports of our natural resources and manufacturing products. How does the lack of the American presence in the Arctic have negative consequences on our trade interests? Uh, Congresswoman, there are certainly economic opportunities uh, that the Arctic presents in both shipping of and exporting goods, uh, as well as what we call destinational shipping, which is countries that are going to the Arctic to get mineral and energy resources and taking them back to market. So I would argue for the citizens of West Virginia, uh, increasing safe and secure tr uh, trade and transshipment is a potentially a very positive development for U.S. economic growth. We are challenged by two things, and this gets back to uh, the lack of ratification for the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, we cannot, in the Arctic, potentially mine the seabed because we are not signatories and have not ratified it. Um, and we cannot extend our outer continental shelf um, because we aren't ratifying. These are, we are losing opportunities. 
uh, for, to, for economic investment in the Arctic region, which would benefit all American citizens. Um, and we are not able to uh, protect and ensure uh, the safe and secure transit uh, of those goods, either energy or uh, export, exported goods, uh, if we do not have the appropriate infrastructure to safely do it. That sort of answers my next question on what Congress could do to help alleviate the issue. So what is so important is that we understand the Arctic as a national imperative. I think many times if we think about the Arctic, we may think about simply Alaska's needs for infrastructure, but this is a whole of nation effort. If we want to grow the American economy and jobs, we need to think of the Arctic as, a, a, as something of uh, enhancing our prosperity, but we also have to do it in a secure and stable way that protects America's exclusive economic zone, our territorial waters, and our coastline. So it's sovereignty, it's enhancing American prosperity, but we can only do that with a much uh, more uh, emboldened presence in the Arctic. Our competitors understand the strategic value of the Arctic. We have forgotten it. Thank you. Mr. Treadwell, a deep water port in the Arctic is imperative, as you've mentioned, for American trade to compete in the region. What progress has been made to develop this port infrastructure? Have we done things to identify, and are we helping to facilitate doing such a thing? Well, uh, the, the answer is we haven't done enough, and I, I, I'll put it this way. There is a Port Clarence Council, which has been established to try to develop a, an economic plan for Port uh, Clarence. It was established uh, by Congress, and it set it up between the state of Alaska and Bering Straits. Native Corporation, the Coast Guard, and the Corps of Engineers have been cooperating with that council as they've done their work. Uh, the City of Nome has been working with the Corps of Engineers on, on applicability there for appropriations uh, uh, under an upcoming Water Act. Uh, the Congress has asked uh, the military to look at uh, the military needs for a port. And, you know, I'll, I'll just say with some experience around here that when you, when you ask an agency to say what it needs, if it actually says what it needs, then they're told to pay for it. So you, you, you're not exactly seeing uh, everything that I hoped we would see with, uh, with some of this legislation. But the, the fact is, I believe there's enough on the record right now for Congress to find that it would be absurd for us to, to go into a brand new ocean, newly accessible to the world, and not have a deep water port of refuge and not have a port which could have us play a role in, in uh, assisting shipping and transshipping. And frankly, as we do that, not doing it with a way to have a tariff or some sort of revenue source to help pay for it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all very much for, for being here to testify today. Uh, you, you're all familiar with the fact that in recent weeks, we finally awarded uh, a contract for the first heavy uh, icebreaker, the pole security cutter, in, in, in decades. And we've, we've awarded a contract for one. Um, I think we, we're all of the understanding that that boat is likely going to be south. Um, you, you compare our capabilities and assets to those of other Arctic nations and even to some degree, as you noted, non-Arctic nations, uh, we're getting blown away, not even close, the capabilities those nations have compared to the United States, yet you've all noted the strategic importance of the Arctic to the United States. I'm, I'm just curious, why, why is it that you feel, um, or why is it, what is your opinion as to why the United States is so far behind other Arctic nations in regard to our capabilities and preparation for uh, changing conditions in the Arctic and even just capabilities in the Arctic? Well, it's a great question. I, I think we have forgotten um, how strategic the Arctic is during the well, Second World War uh, and the Cold War. It was so strategic because it reduced the distances between the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. It was vital to protect the United States uh, from Alaska. And then at the end of the Cold War, we forgot uh, that strategic imperative. Uh, okay, so, so we forgot, and let's say that that's the excuse that we just forgot. But then when you see what some of these other countries are doing, and let's be candid, they, these aren't necessarily nations that, that are close allies of ours, uh, wh why would that not raise our concerns or at least curiosity? 
Because it didn't fit into our uh, focus on the Middle East and the Indo-Pacific. As Admiral Allen said, I mean, this is about budgets. And anything that takes focus away from what we are driving towards is a distraction to budgets. And I think this is what our, our military services have really been wrestling with. They're articulating why the Arctic is important now, but no one is redirecting resources to that. So either they're not getting the signal from the top that we have to restructure our priorities and we're gonna to have to make some hard choices. What they're saying is this is a, a, an issue, but we don't have either the, we're stretched on capabilities and readiness or we don't have those resources. And our allies though, excuse me, our adversaries, our peer competitors, understand the strategic importance and are using this time and space to build their capabilities. Yeah, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. Uh, for 20 years, high level decisions about strategic presence in the Arctic and ice breaking have been relegated to mid-level bureaucrats in OMB. Let me repeat for the record, the Office of Management and Budget. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as somebody who is a, an official who, who often tangled with those OMB officials and was told I shouldn't say what, what, what uh, needed to be said around here, I, I, I concur with the Admiral. I, I'm gonna just give you an analogy. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska is the fifth largest air cargo port in the world. Uh, I used to fly on KAL 007, and we tried to stay, obviously, as far away from Russian airspace because when it didn't happen, uh, people were killed. A member of Congress was killed. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, a group of us worked very closely to try to establish the global aviation system, and if today you get on an airplane in Detroit and go to Shanghai, you're dropping pennies from heaven into the Russian treasury. They collect over $500 million a year to pay for a global air traffic system. We collect it, it's used to support essential air service, and we set up a revenue model, uh, whether it was with taxes or fees, to help cover that global seamless system. Now, I've had commandants, not the ones that I'm sitting next to, say, well, I'm not sure I wanna charge for icebreaker services for the Coast Guard, because if somebody needs it and they have to pay for it, they may not call me when they're needed, and lives could be lost, and I understand that. Uh, on the other hand, I will say this, that if you're gonna use the Arctic Ocean and save 20 days travel with a ship that might be carrying 15,000 containers, you can probably afford to drop $500,000 on a voyage, and it only takes a few hundred of those ships, one or two a day, to actually pay for the infrastructure we need. And so we need to think a little bit more creatively, and as we put together this proposal, we met with uh, uh, parliamentary authorities, we met with uh, uh, civil authorities, we met with shippers in Japan, Korea, uh, China, uh, uh, um, Singapore, uh, across Europe. Not everybody is aligned, but we, we did find this. All of them have said, we see the opportunity in the Arctic, but we're not gonna use it until somebody has established reliability. And we put, uh, the Admiral and I worked together on Arctic policy, the uh, actual Arctic policy, the statement uh, signed by President Bush in 2009, implemented by Obama, where we said we want an Arctic Ocean which is safe, secure, and reliable. And we've really dropped thinking about reliability now. So I, I can't tell you, I, I mean, the Arctic is always out of sight, out of mind for, for, for people until they get, you know, until, it's, uh, until the weather report says you're getting cold air. But, but I will say this, it is uh, 10,000 people today will cross the Arctic Ocean on, on aircraft and we've got a way to pay for what we need for safety. We have to think about how to do that for shipping. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Um, now proceed to the uh, second round of questions. I do understand uh, Mr. Larson to be en route. It wasn't my intention to go to a second round, but uh, as courtesy to Mr. Larson, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, prolong torture a little bit longer, ladies and gentlemen. But I do, uh, I do very pr much appreciate uh, the subject you're raising. Um, Dr. Tengstad, would you like to get in on any of this? You have three very aggressive uh, fellow uh, witnesses today. I feel like you might have something to add to this conversation. I, I've actually been humbled and honored to sit back and watch the wonderful conversation happening here. But yes, I'd, I'd like to reflect momentarily on hard choices. You know, I, I thought that was a very astute question about, you know, what, what has happened why are we not thinking of the Arctic more strategically, or why haven't we? 
And the U.S. has a lot of focus areas around the world, a lot of focus areas domestically as well. And there have been choices made to not invest in the Arctic, not focus on the Arctic. There was a lot of sea ice. And now that the rubber is meeting the road, it's time to start refocusing on the Arctic. I'd like to bring to um, you know, all of our attention, as, as we've continued to do over the course of, I'm sure, many of these types of testimonies and hearings, that the Coast Guard has a, U.S. Coast Guard has an impressive array of statutory missions. And that is a service that is already stretched very thin, doing missions all around the world. And to think of what might happen with some of these discrete incidents, that's the Coast Guard that I was talking about earlier, those discrete in incidents, and helping the U.S. enforce governance and sovereignty in the Arctic, it's the Coast Guard. It's going to be the stucky for that in many cases, with partners, naturally, international, domestic partners. But I just wanted to continue to raise that for the committee, that it's an important issue. There are hard choices to be made to be made, but I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to speak from a position of authority on this, but I'm not sure the Coast Guard's in a position to make any more hard choices about its resources if it needs to stretch them into a more active Arctic. So I wanted to leave the committee with that. Uh, thank you. Ms. Gibbs? Uh, I don't really have a just a thought, just a question. Uh, are, how far behind are we compared to what Russia and China's doing? And the possibility of catching up, if, you know, how, far, how fast do we need to act to catch up? When we talk about all the infrastructure, the communications, and the, all the icebreakers and everything, um, you know, how critical is this? I mean, what do we got to do right away? Or, you know, just, just kind of, I guess I'm just challenging your minds here a little bit, or process, because I was delaying for Rick Larson, but go ahead. <laughs> My own estimate, we, we've lost a decade, and this gets back to when President Bush signed the National Security Presidential Directive in 2009, Admiral Allen's last act in the, in the Oval Office. We stopped. We didn't pursue. Russia started including Arctic in its military doctrine in 2007, 2008. China built its first Arctic research station on Svalbard in 2004. Uh, so we, we've we just lost a decade. Uh, it can't take this long to build an icebreaker. It can't take this long to decide on a deep water port. We are now, uh, you know, the more time we lose, um, we will not be able to recover. And I fear we're going to lose access because we will not be able to. Yeah, we're, we're going to lose the commercial access. aspect of it. But I would also argue there's a national security aspect. Correct? Yeah, I yield, I yield back. Thanks. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're all very kind. Uh, let me uh, come back here and ask a few questions. And I want to uh, first uh, just say hello to Admiral Allen again, as well as to Mr. Treadwell. Um, these two gentlemen uh, have been here since um, testifying in the Arctic since 2001, at least since I've been here. So uh, <laughs> thanks for having another hearing on the Arctic. <laughs> um, so a couple questions, uh, first with Ms. Conley, and I know some of this has been asked, uh, or some of this subject matter has been asked, but could you, through your test, you, you have testimony, what are the, answer the question, what are China's motivations regarding the increased Arctic presence? So quite frankly, there is a strong desire for economic presence. Uh, first and foremost, uh, energy resources, which is why they are now uh, investing very strongly in the Yamal LNG project. Um, and I, th I think this will expand, so energy. Uh, secondly, uh, and I, I don't think we should discount that, is the protein. Fisheries uh, are continuing to be very attractive for China's alternative sources. And then finally, shipping. This is an alternative to the Straits of Malacca, should those, for, for conflictual purposes, uh, not be available to them. They see the opportunity of reducing uh, transshipment by 30%, which is why the transpolar route is very important. Um, right now, the Arctic is primarily energy. That will be the, the back and forth to, to Yamal. But every year, they t uh, Costco, the shipping company, tests a container ship. The northern sea route is too shallow for deep container traffic. That's what makes the transpolar route. And if you looked at, at the map, which is why Iceland is so vital 
to hmm. China's uh, projection in the Arctic because, again, they'll need to use the Bering Strait. But you could see where potential port infrastructure in Iceland would then be a dispersant to both uh, North America as well as Northern Europe, uh, potentially. So the, the Chinese have a, vi their vision is to 2040, 2050. They are thinking that far ahead. They are seeing what is possible. They are, are looking for those opportunities. It may not work, but to have that length of projection of what you want and to shape it, to main, you know, to have access to fisheries, shipping, energy. Um, they are, at this point, I don't foresee a military role. It's predominantly economic, but there will be dual use capabilities. We have to remember that the U.S. missile defense architecture is in the Arctic and Thule Air Force Base in Greenland, uh, of course, and, and, and Fort Greeley in Alaska. That could also be potentially compromised. So we have to think more long term in that. And that gets to the next question. What should our motivations be in the Arctic? US, what should U.S. motivations be? This is about protecting the United States. It's about ensuring that we uh, protect uh, our, our territory, our airspace, our, our maritime capabilities first and foremost. And then secondly, we want to shape this region to make sure it's uh, stable and, and prosperous. Uh, to make sure rules and norms are followed, that we have access to the high seas. And in order, in order to do that, we have to increase our physical presence across the region, both terrestrial and maritime. Yeah, so there's a map up, and um, if you look at the side, you can see it. Um, if you put on my glasses, you can see it. Um, you can barely see it without them. But it, it doesn't do a lot of justice to issues here. And Admiral Allen, maybe you could talk a little bit about this since you've been chewing on this problem for a while. Off of the coast of the United States, um, it's just fairly open water. But if you go to Canada, I mean, it gives an impression of the land masses uh, north of, uh, in northern Canada. But there's many more islands. The same with Russia. It's not as un unpopulated by islands and, and land as it comes across in the map. The point is that every, almost every country's Arctic is a different Arctic, um, and it's impacted by different weather uh, as well. Um, so I'm wondering, if, in your time thinking about this, um, uh, kind of what, what challenges that do each of those Arctics provide to those countries compared to what we have, the challenges that we have with our, our Arctic. I'm sorry that I don't have a lot of time left. I won't keep the committee here long. So. Thanks, sir. Excellent question. First of all, let me associate myself with uh, Ms. Conley's remarks. I support them completely. Let me just add a couple of things onto it. Uh, each one of those routes is different because of the status of the waterways related to whether or not they're in international waters, internal waters, territorial sea, or in the case of the Bering Straits, under the law of the sea treaty, that would be classified as a transit strait. The transit strait is a strait that connects two international bodies of water, and transit through there cannot be inhibited. And when we talk about fees and tariffs, that's all possible. Uh, but there was a landmark case in the, in the Torres Straits north of Australia where they attempted to establish a pilotage charge. And there may be some conflicts moving ahead that have to be discussed. Uh, but it's not clear. Uh, there's a difference in the Canadian view of the Northwest Passage route versus our view. There are still claims on our boundary, the Beaufort Sea. Uh, between the U.S. and Canada, and one of the reasons that the Russians can establish uh, charges there it becomes in internal waters, and they can make that mandatory because it's not a transit strait. Right. Uh, is that helpful? Yeah, that, that is helpful. It's one, one, of the, one of the differences. Did Ms. Tingstad, did you have a? If I, if I may add a follow-up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I guess, Mr. Chairman. Is that all right? Without objection. All right, thank you for the extra Especially time. That's thank you. the final question. Well, thank you all very I'm much. Sorry. Oh, so just a follow up. Quickly. Gentlemen's time has expired, but without objection. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm, I don't. Mean, I thought you were going to submit it for the record. I'm sorry. Did I, did I misunderstand? Oh, no, I, I don't. Oh, forgive me. A, I'm, no, I apologize. Go ahead. No, not at all. No, I, I wanted to add that in terms of the uh, differences in the in the Arctic, we should look forward to the changes that are occurring that are occurring differentially across the region. So those. Routes that we see here, I mean, those are lines lines for convenience, approximately where they would be, of course. But then there's also going to be a differential in, in how quickly those waters will be open and for how long during the year. So, you know, we're looking at actually some studies have shown that that middle route across the center is actually going to be more frequently open for longer durations than 
then the route that goes um, across the North Northwest Passage just due to some long lying ice that's projected to, to stay out there for, for some time. Thank you. Thank you, Doug Tingstead, and forgive my clumsiness, I misunderstood your initial response. I want to thank uh, our panel, seeing no further questions. Uh, from the members, I ask uh, unanimous consent uh, that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. And I'll ask further unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. If no other members have anything to add, um, with sincere thanks to all of you for your, your expertise, your service, your contributions today, your travel from far away. Uh, we very much appreciate your participation. Uh, and the subcommittee stands adjourned. Well done, sir. Thanks. Thanks.